Today is all about uh, not just our theme of growing pains, but about getting stuck, all right, getting stuck in a stage. And so I want to really quickly help us walk through where we've been the last couple of weeks and then talk about why we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today, even before the series is not going to end until next week, but why I'm dedicating today to uh, this idea of getting stuck in a stage, okay? So first and foremost, just remember, we are designed to grow. Don kicked us off, talked about this idea. We're designed to grow. Listen, parents, parents get this. Uh, we take our kids to the doctor, especially when they're young, and then we want to constantly, some of them really obsess over this, we want to constantly know where they're at and if they're on track for growth, right? Nod your head if you're with me, right? You're always like, where are they at? Well, they're the 82nd percentile, you know? And so you're constantly worried about where they are in their growth. And the theme verse for this series has to do with our spiritual our spiritual growth. This comes from Hebrews 5. It says, we have much to say about these things, he says, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. It says, anyone who lives on milk is, say the words out loud, still an infant, still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, about right and wrong. And he says, and, but those with solid food is for the mature, who, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil, all right? Now, for us, I just want you to know, for us as a church, we, we try to do this in everything that we do. We take one or two times a year just to kind of drill down on spiritual growth and spiritual disciplines so that we as a whole church understand what the goal is, what the purpose is for our life. But I do want you to see this. This is something that uh, our staff came up with. Uh, we talked about it as a lead team to give you an opportunity to kind of have a matrix, if you will, of categories and columns of just where you might be in areas of your spiritual growth, okay? And so we, uh, the goal for this, the reason we hand it out every week is hopefully you're taking it home. Uh, you don't have to put it on the fridge and circle it or anything like that. Like that. Like you don't have to do that. But for you, just to know where you are, okay, where, where you might be in your faith. As Don said the first week, everybody has to grow. We all start out at one place spiritually as a baby, as, a, as, a, as an infant, but we grow from there, right? And so there's lots of ways we learn. There's ways that we lead others and teach, and there's ways that we express it emotionally uh, through our personality, through our spiritual gifts, ways in which we practice, okay? And that's, and that's just kind of the, just a few on the surface ideas of where we are in terms of baby, toddler, child, teen, young adult, and adult in terms of maturing. Now, when we talk about maturing in the faith, we're talking about growing through these stages. But at the end of the day, the adult stage, right, the maturity stage is what we're shooting for. That's what we're shooting for, right? So that we can be, we can be uh, independent and balanced in how we receive from God and how we learn and how we study. We can be humble and informed when it comes to how we lead and teach others, right? We can have a healthy life and a healthy uh, practicing of how we express our emotions, how we express our gifts, how we express through our person, the way we've been wired, how we express and grow in Christ individually. And so that's the goal, all right? This is not, however, a finish line, okay? This is not a destination like finish line. Maturity is not the destination. It's the new normal that God wants for everyone. Everybody with me? All right, he just wants you to work out of a place of maturity, it's not something you get to and you get an award, okay? You know, there's no, there's no cape that you get to be a super Christian when you get to maturity, right? It's just a new normal. It's the place he wants every one of us to grow to and then work out of so we can experience the fullness of God in our lives and we can be used by God to our fullest uh, potential for what he's called us to do. And last week, I just kind of walked through how we do move from stage to stage, and it's all tied up in spiritual disciplines. You may have heard that term before. It's just some of the things we use, the practices, we call it, in terms of how we grow. And the spiritual disciplines, I just broke it up into three categories. I can't go through the whole list again today, but uh, I didn't even give you an exhaustive list last week. Spiritual disciplines to me is any command that God's given us that helps us grow, period, okay? Any command God gives us that helps us grow is a spiritual discipline. I just talked about what they do. Okay, there's some disciplines that help us receive, receive from God what he wants for us. There's some disciplines that help us cultivate, help us transform, help us process what God's trying to tell us. And there's some that are specifically to practice, that we're the, kind of the outflow, again, of us practicing in our faith. 
But last week I ended by saying that, hey, listen, for many people, just kind of getting into the disciplines, they're not even there. They're not even able, like they're not even motivated to get into any new disciplines or engaged disciplines at all because they're kind of stuck in a rut. They're stuck, right, in their faith. They're stuck in their spiritual stage. And so today, I want to talk about being unstuck, all right? But before we do that, I want you to understand what's at, what's at stake, okay? Now, in, in, the, in the world that we live in, any time that we get stuck in an area of growth, uh, we call it arrested development, okay? Now, spiritually, you'll hear the word spiritual immaturity. That's the way the Bible talks about it, the way Christians talk about it. But in everywhere else, physically, emotionally, you know, everybody knows this term. We would call it arrested development, right? It's an abnormal, right? It's an abnormal state where growth stops prematurely. Why? Because we're designed to grow. We're designed to grow. So when you stop growing, when you stop moving forward, it's abnormal and it's premature in terms of your growth. And for us as a church, we want to make sure that you understand what's at stake if this begins to happen spiritually in your life, that you just get stuck. You're stuck in, a, in one of these stages of adolescence, and you're not moving any further in your life. Here's how Paul, I'm going to use the message uh, paraphrase a couple times today. I like the way Eugene Peterson kind of uses some modern language to help us kind of put some meat to the bones in terms of scripture, in terms of what it means. But here's how Paul says it to the church in Corinth in the message paraphrase, he says it this way. He says, you are acting like infants in relation to Christ. Talking to the church. He says, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem to be capable of anything more. Right? You don't seem to be able to do anything more, so I'll do it. But here's what I want you to see. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast? content, pacified, only when everything is going your way. Okay? Now, guys, I don't want you thinking about other Christians that you know. Okay? <laughs> it's going to be temptation all morning long. But this is what Paul says is at stake. This is what's at stake. And we use a term, and I want to kind of help you take a phrase that maybe you've heard before and really put, put some, some handles on it to know why it's so important. Why do we need to talk about this idea of being stuck and getting unstuck in a premature, abnormal state of growth? And that is because there's a difference between childish faith and childlike faith. Now, if you've never heard the term childlike faith before, all right, this is a, a term that Jesus uh, referenced in terms of having faith like a child. Some people immediately think of child faith or child's faith as being something that's blind, that's being something that's in, uninformed, right? That's something that's, that has a, a sense of immaturity already with it. But honestly, when Jesus talks about a childlike faith, when he talks about the faith of a child, he's describing the full and complete trust that someone has and their willingness to obey, right? And not just the trust and obedience, but a childlike faith, when they're not obeying, are quick to be rebuked and corrected and repent, right? They're quick to understand the correction and the rebuking of their behavior and the correction of their thinking, and they're able to repent of it. Why? Because they have complete and total trust in their heavenly Father. That's what Jesus is referencing when he references a childlike faith versus what Paul is describing, which is a childish faith, right? It's a childish faith. It's a faith that is not content unless it is pacified. And when it's pacified, it is pacified on the, on the surface level of Christianity. It means you can't deal with anything too complex. You can't practice anything too difficult because every time it gets a little uncomfortable, every time life gets a little inconvenient, every time you, you want to grab for the things that you want versus what God wants, anytime you want to put value on something that God doesn't put value on like you do, you begin to whine, right? That's childish faith. You've prayed for something for a couple days and God hasn't come through and now you've questioned whether God exists right? That's childish faith. 
And Paul is saying, this is a problem in the church. He's telling the church in Corinth, this is a problem for you. We have too many, I'll just say this for me, we have too many people who claim to be Christians in our country, in our society, in our culture, who cannot handle the adult-sized problems they're trying to handle because they have childish faith. They have childish faith. They do not have complete and total trust in their heavenly father. And they're not willing to obey and be corrected and, and to be rebuked and quickly repent to obedience. They're childish. They whine. They complain. All they want is what they want. Are you any different than a baby? Slap back on the nurse to be pacified? No. And so today, just to let you know, next week, we're going to go back and try to inspire you to continue to know what God has for you and move you in the direction of, of, of growing. Uh, last couple weeks, that's been our goal. Today is the kick in the pants Sunday, okay? Aren't you glad you came this morning? All right. It's the kick in the pants Sunday. It's my job this morning just to deliver to you the urgency of how important it is that you do not remain stuck in a childish faith. And here's four ways. I'm going to talk about the ways we get unstuck Okay, no matter what, no matter what you, where you find yourself in that's not in that maturing stage, I want you to get unstuck. And there's four statements I'm going to give you and walk you through some scripture there. But the first one is this, is that in order to get unstuck, we have to listen and not forget, right? We have to understand what it means to listen and not forget. Matter of fact, if you go back to the Hebrews passage, Hebrews that we were reading earlier, our theme verse, again, I love the paraphrase uh, passage here, the paraphrase version where it says, I have a lot more to say about this, but it's hard to get it across to you since you have picked up the bad habit of what's the two words? Of what? Of not listening, right? Now, every parent in the room gets it, right? Every parent of teenagers and teenagers get it, right? You start to explain something, you start to tell them something, and you've seen the eyes glaze over, right? You've seen them glaze over. And I know that all of you want to lose your salvation and smack the snot right out of your children. And if you don't, you're lying, okay? That's like you, you know the sense of when they've just stopped listening. You, any adult in the room knows this when you've had friendships and people at work and people you've connected with and, and they come and share their problems with you and they share what's going on in their life and they ask for advice and they ask for insight and you do your very best to speak into that and give them wisdom and they don't do anything with it, right? Like they're not even listening. You're going to have the same conversation a month from now as if no one has ever said anything to them about it because they're not listening. And here's the problem with Christianity, with our current state of childish faith, we have, a bad, we have picked up this bad habit of not listening, which is why we talked last week. Again, you're going to hear a lot of references to last week. If you weren't here, you need to go back and listen to it and watch it. A lot of references to the receiving disciplines, right? The good teaching and the reading and hearing of God's word and the Christ-centered friendships, because out of all those disciplines in which we receive and which God pours through people and through his word to help us receive what we need to receive from him, all that is so that we can listen. But when we do not have those disciplines, when we do not engage in those things, we're just not listening. And what's worse is that we'll forget, right? We'll forget. We're not even really intentionally living a life to hear from God. And that's a problem. And one of the biggest ways this shows up, I'll just tell you from a church perspective, one of the biggest ways this shows up is in people who begin to drift away from the church. Okay, you drift away from the church because you begin to do things alone. You can't serve and you're, you know, you can't serve like you once used to because summer's here and your kids' sports things are different and you got vacation coming, so you had to pull out of serving, so you're not serving anymore. Uh, last year, you know, some life things changed and your group um, dissipated and you're supposed to start a new group this year, but you don't, chose not to because life is crazy and so you didn't do group and, you know, Sunday mornings are just, you know, they're kind of the bottom of the list in terms of options for the things you need to do and accomplish on your weekend. You only have so many days, you only have so many hours, and so you have to take advantage of the time and do this, and church just makes it when it can make it. And people, and I've told you last week that people who, who begin to see this drifting in their life, they, they don't, their devotion for God does not grow, it diminishes. Why? Because when they begin to think about their spiritual growth and they're doing it in isolation, 
Okay, they're doing it by themselves. You are not doing it the way God designed it to happen. So one of the ways, and the reason I say this, one of the ways we listen best, one of the ways we, we remember well, is in the t- context of community. Okay, it's in the context of what we're doing now. It's in the context of groups and, and Christ-centered friendships and personal devotion, personal devotions and personal reading of, and hearing of God's word. And here's the, the tension that a lot of people feel. The tension that they feel is that we are personally responsible for our own growth, but growth is actually fueled by community, right? We're, we're personally responsible for our own spiritual growth in terms of these stages. Guess what? No one else is going to be held accountable to God for how you did or did not grow in your faith. I can tell you one thing, it ain't going to be me. I'm not going to be responsible for what you did and didn't grow in terms of your faith. You are personally responsible to God and accountable to him for what you've done in your life with what he's given you. But it's fueled best in the context of community. It's fueled best. I I promote you reading scripture and hearing scripture by yourself as much as possible. But if it's only you If you never have an opportunity to discuss that within the context of a small group, in the context of a study with other Christ-centered friends and work out what Scripture is actually saying, I'm telling you, you're going to come up with some whacked out stuff. Okay? We can find and we can maneuver the loopholes in Scripture to make it say whatever we want it to say. So part of listening is doing it in the context of community. Part of not forgetting is doing it in the context of community, right? When you say it out loud, when you challenge someone else with what you've been reading and hearing and listening to, and they challenge you and what you're hearing and what it says and how it's interpreted, it's iron that sharpens iron. That's what Scripture says, right? That's what it looks like. But we can't do that if we're drifting away. Can't do that if we're stuck in in a stage and stuck with childish faith. We have to work it out Work it out in community, okay? You need people. Again, Christ-centered friendships. I can't, we do, we do groups and things. I can't say that hard enough because you need people in your life to be able to tell you. When you come up with something dumb like, you know, I think God told me to do this. I think God told me to divorce my spouse. You need to have somebody in your life that goes, where the heck did you read that? Why in the world would you ever think that? And then you need Christ-centered friends in your life to encourage you right? To be able to affirm in you what God might be saying to you. To be able to to cheer you on when you're struggling. To remind you. One of the great things about my life group, I'm just telling you, some circles of friends that I have, is that you will see them go through stuff in their faith, and I get to have the opportunity to remind them of ways in which God has already provided for them. In ways in God's which are, he's already shown up. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Oh, that's right. You know, this, the, the idea of not, not forgetting is part of this getting unstuck so you can remember what God has done for you. But sometimes I ask people the question, hey, what's God saying to you right now? What's God saying to you right now? And as some people begin to kind of, in their mind, think they start trying to ponder some profound thing that God just said, like right now, if I said to you right now, hey, what's God saying to you right now? You might think of some profound, you're trying to think of some profound thing that came through this week that you think was from God, and you have forgotten we've just read three passages from his word. We just read three passages. Oh, he's telling you something, right? You just may not be listening. We have to listen. We have to have those disciplines to receive, and we need to work on not forgetting, right? Not easily letting it just slip through our mind. So we can start getting unstuck from some of these stages. Number two, one of the ways we get unstuck is that we have to apply what we learn. We have to apply it. Okay? We have to have the cultivating disciplines in our life to help it, let it transform our lives and apply it. Here's a Hebrews 5 again in the message where it says milk for the beginners is inexperienced in God's ways, but solid food is for the mature who have some practice, right? Some practice in telling right from wrong. The idea of practice in your faith means that you have stepped out of your comfort zone. It means that you have tried something. You have have attempted to apply something in your life 
that you either know God's saying to you or you believe God is saying to you, so you're trying to apply it. You're trying to take steps of faith. That's what they're called, right? You're trying to take steps of faith. You're, you're going to apply what you've learned. You're going to apply the knowledge that you already have. But what most of us, I'm just, I'm throwing myself in there, what most of us are completely guilty of is that our knowledge, right, our knowledge far exceeds our willingness to obey. Our knowledge far exceeds our willingness to apply it and to obey. I tell people all the time that, honestly, if you were raised if you were raised in a, in a, in a Bible-believing church, if you were raised as a child in that church and you're now an adult and you're still in church, listen, you are far more educated. You have more knowledge at your disposal in terms of the Word of God than many, many missionaries and pastors in third world and developing countries. You have more. And some people just don't understand that, that you, you've been so blessed to have all of the, this Word of God at your disposal, to be in good churches, to be in good groups and environments, to be able to learn that. The problem is not more knowledge in your life. It's whether or not you're going to do anything with it. It's whether you're going to apply it. We say no to God more than you would probably be comfortable admitting. We just say no. We know it, we've heard it, we've been told it, we read it. And even after all of that has come to us, oh, we didn't say it out loud, but our refusal to apply it simply is a no to God, right? We say, we say no to the disciplines of reading and receiving and hearing the Word of God. We say no to applying most of what He gives us. We say no to the many other disciplines that help us cultivate and help us practice our faith. We say no to community more than anything. We say no to serving others. When opportunities arise, when Don talks about making a difference in our community and being a part of Symphony at the Park and doing that, it goes in one ear and out the other. It's not that you don't know it's happening. It's not that you don't know the opportunity is there. It's just that you've said no. You said no to surrender areas of your life that you don't want to live God's way. Whether that's financially, right? You've just said, I want to surrender my eternity to Christ. No, not that. I'm not going to surrender that. Oh, I want to surrender my Savior and my Lord, but I don't want to surrender the way I physically respond in relationships to people right now. I'm not going to surrender that. Oh, we say no to God. This is one of the most difficult reflections you could ever partake in. One of the most difficult things you could ever do is pray to God and sit down for 10 uninterrupted minutes and say, God, why don't you just fill me in on all the things I'm saying no to you about right now? Oh, you'll make a list. I promise you, you'll make a list. Because our knowledge, what we know already, far exceeds our willingness to obey. And you have to change that. You have to apply what you learn to get unstuck from where you are. There's no other way. One of the reasons, and I'll just throw this out. This is just something that I felt like needed to be said. One of the reasons we, we struggle to apply what we've learned, those cultivating disciplines I talked about last week, Sabbath and fasting and rest and all of those things in worship is because we're so busy. We're so busy. My generation and the generation after me struggles because we have placed value on busyness. We've placed values on going full tilt and, ha and living with no margin. Now, some of the older generation lives this way, but I'm saying my generation and below, I mean, we're going to be most guilty of this, that we are very busy with many things, but we are accomplishing nothing of importance right? Oh, we're very busy with many things, but we're, we're not actually accomplishing anything that eternal, that matters, that's going to help us get unstuck. We have to apply what we already know, what we learn. This is the third one. So we're not easily influenced or deceived. This is the statement of someone who's maturing. And this is the only way to get unstuck is to kind of challenge this within you. So we're not easily influenced or deceived. Here's uh, what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, that we, we will no longer be immature like children, and we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. 
Remember last week I talked about what it looks like to be slave to what sounds right? Okay, to be slave to what sounds right in the moment? I love this, again, the paraphrase in Ephesians says, no prolonged infancies, please. That's Paul, please. In the church, no prolonged infancies, right? We have got to, now before you, and and this is one of those tough ones because um, you're going to basically think, well, I'm not, I'm a grown person. I am not easily influenced, nor do I feel like I'm deceived but you are forgetting the self-deception that exists in your life. Okay, and if you won't admit it, I'll admit it. I can convince myself of almost anything, right? If I really want to, I can deceive myself. I can influence my thoughts in a way I want to influence them. So it doesn't always have to do with others. I'm talking about you too. We are not easily influenced and deceived. What, what I think is one of the bigger struggles, and I'm going to talk about this over the next several months. I have a couple different uh, messages planned, but one of the biggest struggles we have in our culture is this my truth versus your truth culture that we live in, right? Which is really just a form of relativism. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's just a form of relativism, which basically the easiest way to state relativism is that, that your knowledge and your truth and your morality exist in relationship with culture and society, and they are not absolute. They are not absolute. They are completely dependent and, and, and leaning against the, the, the framework of what sounds right right now. Oh, for my parents, the way they thought sounded right to them for, where they, for the time they lived in. But for me, what, tr- what is true is this. What, is, what I believe is this. What I'm going to choose to put stake in the ground is this because it's what sounds right right now. And I have convinced myself that it's right. We need to be very careful, and I put this on here. I want to make sure you, you saw this in terms of the way we, we express and the way we lead. But you need to be very careful in terms of understanding what may be a conviction of yours, what may be an actual conviction of yours, Versus what is just messy trying and an opinionated ignorance. You might even make your way to informed preference. Okay? But that's very few of us. For most of us that struggle with this relativism in our lives and you don't even know you're struggling with it. It's opinionated ignorance. Okay? It's strong, passionate feelings that we believe are convictions. Now, i got to be honest with you. Convictions, this is something we've lost some of in our culture, but convictions have three things to them, okay? Convictions have clarity of truth, okay? Which means that if you are asked about something that you are actually convicted about, you know exactly what you're basing your belief on. And then you have passion. You have something that burdens your heart. You have something that, makes you, that stirs you within. But also a conviction has purpose, Convictions have purpose, and they cannot be just your self-interest. So when you hear somebody on Facebook passionately arguing something because they just feel that way, that's not a conviction. It's not a conviction. It's just, an, it's just being influenced and deceived by stuff that sounds right at the time. It sounds right for now. It's not an actual Conviction. So you have to, listen, you want to get unstuck, you have to challenge some of your convictions. You have to challenge why you believe what you believe. Because, listen, if you're not willing to do that, if you remain stuck, if you remain in this childish faith, and then you begin to speak on behalf of Christ, you begin to speak on behalf of Christians, you are part of the problem, not part of the solution. You with me? You need to get off social media and stop watching the news. That's what you need to do, all right? If you don't know how to challenge the convictions that you have and work through, what is, it, what is it I'm basing this belief on? Where is the clarity of the truth that I have? Why does it stir me emotionally? Why does it stir my heart and give me a burden? And what's its purpose? 
Oh, I promise you, a biblical conviction is going to be based on the source of absolute truth. And it's going to be a burden in your heart because of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, that gives you the burden and passion for it. And its purpose, I'll tell you right now, it is not just to justify your life and what you chose to do. It is going to be to serve others. Those are biblical convictions. I'm telling you, everybody in this room, this week, whether on social media or in person, you put a stake in the ground about something that you feel strongly about, but it's probably not a conviction. It's just the whim that's a wave being tossed to and fro. And in order to get unstuck, man, you're going to have to challenge some of those things. You have to challenge why you believe what you believe. Who told you that? You're holding a conviction to something that You heard a preacher say years ago in your life, and you've never found the scripture for it. You've never understood where it comes from. You don't even know why you should care about it unless it justifies your life, and then it's just a self-interest. We're going to have to, have to get unstuck from this influence and deceived life. Okay, the fourth one. We've got to understand that there's more for us. There's more at stake. This is really quick, Okay. Let's go through a couple scriptures. Again, the message passage as you continue reading through Hebrews 5 and, and 6. I love this phrasing. He's talking about these babies. He's talking about these infants. And he says, come on, let's leave the, pringer, the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ. Let's leave those behind, right? And get on with the grand work of art. Get on with this grand work of art. Grow up in Christ, Right? There's so much more that you don't even realize is there. There's so much more for you to experience and for you to be a part of. Let's leave these finger, you know, there's a time for the finger painting. Don't stay there. It goes on to say this in in, uh, Ephesians. Instead now, we're going to speak the truth in love. We're going to grow every way more and more like Christ, who's the head of the body, the church, And then again, he puts this thing together where he says, he makes the whole body fit together, every single one of us. Each part does its own special work, and it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We have to know, we have to know that there is more at stake. Okay, one of the best ways to get unstuck from any of these stages is to continue to corporately gather with other believers. Why? Because, listen, my desire to be here and be a part of this with you when it has nothing to do with me is only Christ. Everybody with me? Okay, my desire, my longing to corporately gather, to be a part of groups, to be a part of serving others in our city, to be be a part of the grand work of art, and it not have to do with me, that is only Christ in me that makes me want that. And so for all of us, there's a, there's a practice, there's a, there's a discipline of engaging in corporate opportunities so that we can experience the body of Christ together and shake us loose that we think our faith is about us because our life is about us and our beliefs are about us and we need to blow those up. And these are just some ways to begin the process Just getting unstuck wherever you are, right? I'll just go through the four again. We listen. We're not easily going to forget. We apply what we learn, what we already know. We're not going to be easily influenced or deceived, especially internally, especially us. We're going to understand that there's more. There's more for you. There's more at stake in what's going on. There's more, Right? Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, sometimes, as as we talked about last week, sometimes there's ways in which you can just sort of tweak, okay, tweak, everybody say tweak, it's a weird word, right, so just tweak, there's ways in which you can tweak some things in your life by adding a discipline and by by, by continuing to challenge yourself in in a few areas, there's times in growth in which that's good, there are other times, okay, there are other times in which I believe you need TNT therapy, okay? Which means you need to blow something up. That's what it means. Now, the immature, the immature 
do reckless things. They blow up their marriage. They blow up their career. They blow up their relationships because they, they just desperately need to get unstuck from their life. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about spiritually, you blowing up some stuff in your life. You need to blow up some bad habits, right? You do. You need to blow up your, your spiritual laziness and dullness of not listening. You need to blow up some of the convictions you think you have that you've slapped Jesus sticker on. You don't even know if they're biblical convictions. You need to blow up some of this isolation and doing it alone and no one can tell me what to do and no one can, no one can help me grow but me. No, you need to blow some of that up because community fuels spiritual growth. You need to blow up some stuff in your life. And I'm talking, to, I, I can't tell you what to do, but think of the most drastic thing you can do and go one step further. That's what I would tell you to do. Because if you do not want to remain stuck because there is so much more at stake, you need to take drastic action. Okay, We don't need any more people in the church representing Christ with childish faith. Guys, we have too many adult-sized problems and ways in which we need to engage our current culture and engage our current world and the ridiculousness of some of the things happening in our world, and we need to engage it with a childlike faith that is mature in Christ. So we can be everything he wants us to be, so that we can do everything he's called us to do, so we can experience the fullness of the love of God in our lives. I want to end today a little bit unique. I want to end today with a benediction, okay? And if you weren't raised in church and raised in a certain kinds of church, you may not know what a benediction is, okay? It's, it's a prayer. It's usually scripture. It's, it's a statement that's given and spoken over you for something for you to receive, okay? For you to receive. And sometimes you, it's usually at the end of the service and everybody stands up and it's something very usually short like, well, God bless you and keep you and make his face smile. You know, everybody knows those words, right? And make his face smile upon you and give you peace. You know, we're not doing that today, okay? But I do want you to go through the practice this morning of receiving, learning how to receive a benediction in your life. So here's how you receive. Put your hands out. You can remain seated, by the way, because Chris will come up and give you some closing stuff. But I just want you to sit there. I want you to leave your hands out. This is just a physical representation of your heart to receive God's word. And in this case, we're going to read Paul's prayer for the church, Paul's prayer for spiritual growth. I'm going to read it, and I want you to receive it as we close today. Ephesians 3 says, Paul says, when I think of all of this, when he's thinking about the church, when he's thinking about the work of Christ on our behalf, he says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything on heaven and on earth. I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his Holy Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots right, will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen.